Wii U. Have I ever talked about a thing called the Wii U? Look, I had a pretty good time with it, but I'm also not that delusional. It did have some of the greatest games of all time, like Tropical Freeze, Bayonetta 2, Mario Kart 8, but between the good stuff, there was a whole lot of nothing. There were some hidden gems that absolutely got overlooked. I'll tell you until the day I die that Zombie U was pretty good, and Tekken Tag Tournament 2 is rad as flap and flip. Look at this! Why did no one buy it? But even with my exhaustive example of five games, the system still took a long time to find its own identity, if it ever found it. If it wasn't trying to keep being the Wii with games like Wii Sports Club, Wii Fit U, Wii Party U, it was trying to be a bigger 3DS, with essentially the same smash on both systems, the big 3D Mario being a sequel to the small 3D Mario, and stuff like Paul Block's World. Great versions of all those games, absolutely, but not exactly the best way to get 3DS owners excited to buy another console. And it was called the Wii U. Oh yeah, it was called the Wii U. But, in came 2015 with a mission. This is when a ton of truly unique, console-defining games finally came to the Wii U. And yeah, I know, 2015, of course, there was some filler, like Amiibo Festival and Ultra Smash, but we also got the biggest RPG on the platform with Xenoblade Chronicles X, a game that's still exclusive. A 2D Mario you can play forever, and the most evergreen game on the console that would change the standards of every shooter released on Nintendo systems. It would go on to sell 4.95 million units to an install base of only 13.56 million consoles. I'm not still talking about Zombie U. Splatoon was the freshest thing the Wii U would ever see. It not only actually used the controller in a cool way, which by the way the only other game to do that was Zombie U, but it took Nintendo into a brand new genre, and for many, it would dominate everything else available. It's just a genius loop. You shoot ink to move, but to reload you need to rest in the ink, so you're essentially moving to shoot and shooting to move. It's one of Nintendo's oldest design approaches of getting the most out of simple inputs, and in a multiplayer game that essentially never ends, it always feels clever. There's so much you can do too, like do you go in guns blazing, or do you sneak around in the ink, nudging the controller ever so slightly so they can't see you, and then jump out for an attack? Oh. Or do you ink the walls and get to a higher surface for a vertical approach? Walls don't go towards points in a turf war, but movement is key. Taking the time to ink stuff that doesn't contribute can be a big contribution. And Gyro, man! I actually played Splatoon just after it got announced at a Nintendo event in 2014, and I remember touching that controller, getting my first kill, and knowing I wanted every shooter to play like this from now on. It's just so good. Nintendo had done a little gyro before, like an Ocarina of Time 3D, and it ruled there too, but applying it to a shooter like Splatoon was a game changer. Not everyone clicks with it, and that's cool. And for those who physically can't use motion, you can turn it off, and that's awesome. But if it resonates with you, there is no going back. You know, when I talk about gyro, I think some people assume I mean like, this, but yeah, no. Gyro is so good for micro adjustments, the tiniest movements. When you're tracking a player with a stick, you do these tiny little flicks, and it's, it's not accurate. It's why so many console games use aim assist. But with motion, it's as easy as just slightly moving your body. It makes things like sniping so much easier. And you can use it for big swoops too, but for the most part I think this is the strength of gyro. The tiniest movements. And the important thing to remember is gyro doesn't replace stick. You're still using the right analog stick as a camera, but when it comes to actually aiming, gyro takes the lead, baby. This was so revolutionary and fun that if a shooter comes to a Nintendo console without gyro, players are gonna shout at them and bury them in a hole that's just deep enough as not to trap them because that wouldn't be ethical, but still pretty deep. You don't want to be in a hole, do you? Put gyro in your games. After Splatoon, we had games that never had gyro on other consoles, just get it on Switch. Games like Doom, Wolfenstein, Resident Evil 5, Overwatch, Splatoon was that good. It made Gyro a standard for Nintendo and third parties. Even Fortnite, the biggest game in the world, has Gyro on Switch, and now PlayStation. And other Sony games like The Last of Us and Horizon Forbidden West have started using it too. It's spreading. But everything I'm praising applies to the whole Splatoon trilogy. We're a trilogy now. The series is yet to drastically change, and so whenever a new one comes along, people go, Splatoon 2, more like Splatoon 1.5, Splatoon 3, more like Splatoon 2.5, but then they actually play the game and go, oh, this is pretty good. This is the general loop of pre-launch criticism. But why the doom and gloom each time? Well, I think Splatoon often looks like you remember. 
Inklings shoot guns, you hide in the ink, and you win objectives. The core foundation looks the same across all three games. Apart from the Inklings grow each time, I didn't realize this until recently, but they get taller. But apart from that, I was actually extremely surprised just how different each game actually feels going back and forth between them. Even just controls and movement. I think compared to Splatoon 1, Splatoon 2 feels a bit more agile. It's weird, we don't usually complain when other shooters get sequels. I mean, very few shooter franchises redefine themselves with each entry. Despite Halo 2 and Halo 3 sharing a lot of the same maps, they stand on their own from a gameplay perspective and get praise for their differences, both big and small. In my opinion, the exact same situation applies to Splatoon as well. I actually kind of forgot just how big the graphical jump was. Splatoon 1's art style is pretty strong, but for such a colorful game, it's actually surprisingly dark if that makes any sense. Like, look at any map that's not coloured with ink, and it looks pretty damn flat. Mahi Mahi Resort doesn't even really have any shadows going on. Like, there's a few objects with big shadows in the environment, but for the most part, it's just this big, flat white texture. It's not so hot. The graphical jump from the 1 version to the 3 version is pretty fast. I mean, it, it's got shadows now. Lighting's one of the big differences for sure. Like, look at the Squid Sisters in Splatoon 1. Their designs are cool, but it's very one key for light. But Splatoon 2, look it off the hook! It's so much better composed and just feels more dynamic. And clearly, budget also went to animations this time. I guess that's what selling to a whole third of the user base does to you. We can directly compare maps like Port Mackerel 2, which are largely the same from a design standpoint, but again, lighting and shadowing are so much better. And look at my man Sheldon! This fella's so much prettier in Splatoon 2. I also noticed in Splatoon 1 that some maps like Anko V Games actually do drop frames sometimes. But you know, something I hear a lot is Splatoon 2 replaced Splatoon 1. That Splatoon was essentially ported to Switch and there's no reason to play the first game if you've got the second game. This is what I call Rongo language, the language of the wrong. There's many reasons I can still very quickly and easily find a game with random seven years and two sequels later. There's a ton that makes Splatoon 1 distinct to this day. First off, maps. But wait, weren't all the Splatoon 1 maps in Splatoon 2? Stop speaking Rongo language! Splatoon 2 recrafted 9 of the original Splatoon 1 maps, but 7 remain. Some of the best 7 in the game, in fact. This is one of my favorite Splatoon maps in general, Flounder Heights. You've got this big apartment complex that separates the two sides, and you can either scale it to the top and go straight over, or scale it in the middle and go through the middle. That's often where a lot of the conflict is. Awesome map, so good. Then there's Salt Spray Rig, one of the launch maps. You've got this big open area in the middle with these storage containers, and you can either go up these stairs to get to it, or these conveyor belts, which move faster, but you're also quite vulnerable going on them. And like, the most iconic map from the game? Hurricane Underpass. This was the first we ever saw of Splatoon. It has the big confrontation area in the middle, but you can slide under the gates and attack from above if you want. And you might be thinking, but John, I've played this map on the Switch, and yeah, in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, where it appeared for some reason, but not in the Splatoon game on the console. I don't get it, man. Bluefin Depot is a rad one. You've got these two separate mirrored zones in the middle. You jump down from your tall towers and just blast everywhere. Great for splat zones. This is an awesome map. And the remaining three are actually set to return in Splatoon 3. We've got Hammerhead Bridge with the long, vulnerable bridge on the top layer and a big inkable surface on the bottom. Museum Del Alfonso with its rotating pillars and Mahi Mahi Resort where the water level changes mid-game. I imagine the remaining four will find their way to Splatoon 3 eventually, but just comparing it to Splatoon 2, I think one has plenty of exclusive maps, and still, even the returning ones did change a lot. Like, Mori Towers in Splatoon 2 has additional platforms and a bunch of rails that weren't in Splatoon 1. It changes the dynamics a lot. The biggest difference, though, is the weapons and the specials. Even weapons that return feel drastically different. However, it's really all about the specials. I often see people say that Splatoon 2s aren't balanced, and I'm, I'm not sure balance is the word I would use for this one either. They're terrifying. One of them not only makes you completely invincible, but any ally that comes near you becomes invincible too. Splatoon 2 took this idea and made temporary body armor that can be shot off. But in Splatoon 1, you better just run away. But what's better than being temporarily invincible? Being temporarily invincible, but also being a flippin' kraken! You move fast, you lay out ink as you go, so it doesn't matter if there's enemy ink ahead of you, and jumping just kills everyone. It's great as an escape plan, it's great for an offense, and if someone else has it, it's a great way to die. I love and fear the Kraken. Killer Whale sets out a giant jet across the entire stage, and again, this one kinda came back in Splatoon 2 as the Stingray, and you could control that one, but the radius of the shot was much smaller. 
Killer Whale is less forgiving in that sense, but it's devastating if it lands right, especially in rank modes. Stuff like the Ink Strike too, use that in splat zones and you'll for sure stop the countdown. You've also got the Ink Zooka, and it's funny because in Splatoon 1, the Rainmaker and the Ink Zooka are pretty much the exact same, whereas in Splatoon 2, they change the Rainmaker to be an explosive shot. You've also got Bomb Rush, where you can throw a bunch of bombs, and Echo Locator that shows the location of all the enemy team. You know, looking back, these are a lot of fun. I think they're more fun than the specials in Splatoon 2, to be honest. Some are definitely better than others, and a few of them are pretty busted, but they really do set the games apart. These specials are so prominent to every single multiplayer match. Splatoon 1 is not Splatoon 1 without the Kraken and the Killer Whale. There's a lot of purists that still prefer Splatoon 1 for a lot of these reasons. It controls a bit differently, they prefer the specials, they like the maps that weren't carried over. A lot of them are Japanese, which makes sense as that's where Splatoon is most popular, but it's still kinda mad to see. Wii U was not a popular console at all, where two games divorced from the original, but man, look at all of them! There's constantly games to find, whether it's regular Turf War or Ranked, and it may sometimes take a few seconds to find all the players, but it never takes long. Oh, and Clan Blitz wasn't a thing yet, so Ranked doesn't have that, so that's a point in Splatoon 1's favour. I will say though that I quite liked how future games didn't show how many times you died in a game. Yeah, no one needs to see that. You can look at this one though. That's the benefit of editing my videos, I can hide all my failures from you. There is stuff that isn't so hard though. Say what you will about Splatoon rotating its map selection for matchmaking, but Splatoon 2 changed it so it's just a 2 hour wait, whereas in Splatoon 1, it rotates every 4 hours. I know the idea is that you keep coming back at different points in the day, but 4 hours is a lot of time. It also launched with just 5 maps and no mode apart from Turf War, which meant that basically in the first week, it was really hard to see all the maps. There were only 2 available at once and it's just randomly shuffled. Playing all 5 took a while. Now, Rank did arrive only one week later, but the content drip was a little questionable. I imagine this affected review scores quite a bit, so it's a good thing Nintendo stopped doing that, right? Right? Some of the most fun I had coming back was putting private games together, where we can freely pick any map we want in any mode we want. It doesn't have the spectating options of Splatoon 2 and 3, but it was so cool bringing a bunch of Wii U owners together in 2022. Not only were we filling lobbies, but there were people waiting to come in. There were like 40 Wii U owners. Can you imagine that many Wii U consoles together in one room? And Incopolis Plaza! Man, this place was my home in 2015. I always think it's cool when games turn their menus into explorable hubs. Just feels a bit more personal, you know? You can go shopping for new gear and guns, shut up Sheldon, and read all the Miiverse messages scattered around the plaza. I need a moment. Or do I? Here's a tease for my next video. Oh, what's going on? You'll find out next time. And one of the raddest things that people don't really talk about is the local mode in Splatoon 1. Yeah, they had a single console two-player mode! You basically just go around and try and shoot more balloons than your opponent. One played on the gamepad off-screen, while the other person played on the TV, so there's no screen peeking. Unless the gamepad user looks up at the TV. Which is illegal. And remember, the Wii U Pro Controller doesn't have gyro, so you're meant to take your Wii Remote and tie it around the Pro Controller using the wrist strap. I'm not making this up, this is official advice, and you know, it actually works pretty well. Amusingly, they never updated this mode, so it only has the launch map selection. It's like a little frozen point in time, it's kinda cool. So if a friend comes over and for some reason doesn't bring a second Wii U and a second TV with them, you can still play local games in Splatoon 1, and that's so rad. The gamepad in Splatoon is one of the most natural and elegant uses of any Wii U game. I mean Squid Jump! You're searching for a game on one screen, while you're playing the real game on the other screen. This is the dream! Let me tell you what Splatoon 2 did. It didn't bring back Squid Jump, and instead you move the sticks a little bit, and it adjusts the music a bit. This is the lamest downgrade in the world. You can at least train in Splatoon 3 while waiting, but I don't know, is that better than Squid Jump? No. No it's not. When it comes to actual in-game gamepad features, I think this is peak Wii U. At any point, you can just glance down, see where's been inked, where's been missed, where the conflict's happening, or easily squid jump to an ally by tapping them. It's so elegant. But it's not like Splatoon is broken without this, you know? Splatoon 2 and 3 make this a toggleable map, and that's fine. I don't think a ton is really lost without it, but it's damn good with it. In Splatoon 2 and 3, I only really squid jump while spawning, but in this, I was doing it mid-match quite a lot. 
Like if there's a bunch of enemies coming at you, you just tap. It's that easy. Whereas in the later games, you press X to open the map, you use gyro to like aim at where you want to go, you press a button, that's too many inputs for a spur of the moment thing. And while we're talking about the controller, on Wii U, X is jump rather than B. I think it's just because they're closer to the analog stick because Wii U is above and Switch is below, so it makes sense. But it's kind of funny all the same. Go ahead and laugh, everyone. <laughs> what an amusing button. But we're like 15 or 16 minutes in and haven't even talked about the single player yet. That's the thing a lot of people say is the big difference between 1 and 2. A totally different story mode. And yeah, it's really good, really cool, but... I think it's one of the smallest differences on the list. What I mean is single player is something you spend like, what, five hours playing? Yeah, there's more to do to fully complete it, and there's a bunch of lore that details due to sea levels rising, humans died 12,000 years ago, but it's a blip in the overall Splatoon experience. You can put 100 plus hours into the core multiplayer, and these differences, both major and minor, add up to what I think is the real difference between one and the rest of the series. As insignificant as it sounds, I think the soundtrack being different is more drastic than there being a different single player. A different soundtrack is an entire tonal shift for the bulk of the game. The score for one's a lot more punk inspired, uh, there's a few like, optimistic ones in there, but there's also ones like this, whereas two's a little more techno and happy. I've heard people say they prefer Splatoon 1 because of the soundtrack, that's how big it really is. That doesn't mean single player is insignificant, it's incredibly good. Always reminded me of Mario Galaxy but with more guns, and it's awesome seeing these multiplayer mechanics applied to deliberate level design. The bosses too, they're awesome. If you haven't ever played Splatoon 1, then by all means, go back and play the single player, it's really good. But it's still on the smaller end of differences, don't just play the single player and ignore the rest of the game, because it really isn't the whole experience. Also, when I tweeted saying I was playing Splatoon 1, a bunch of replies were like, "Ah, oh, that game's full of hackers, have you found any hackers yet? And in around 15 hours of footage, no! I'm sure some people do hack, and they're loserinos, but honestly, it doesn't seem as bad as people say. Maybe a few had a bad experience, and that's just kind of echoed through the community, but doesn't seem that bad to me. This industry is always looking forward, and there's always a new game coming out that dominates the social bubble for a bit. But even in iterative franchises, I think it's always important to look back. New games do not replace old ones, and we can take that literally with content. Splatoon 1 has unique single-player content, and map content, and weapon content, but content is a dumb word that doesn't describe quality in any way. If we look at everything by content while missing the context, I think we're missing the point. The feel is what's different. In some ways, the feel and mechanics have evolved for the better, like being able to hold a charge shot while swimming, but in other ways, they've just gone in a different direction rather than definitively improving. I'm not going to tell you Splatoon 1 is a radically different game, but tonally, it is distinct. And if you go back yourself, I think you'll find more differences than you remember. But man, what a game. Somehow became a phenomenon on a failing platform, and with a single sequel, managed to become one of the most successful Nintendo franchises, with Inkling sitting alongside Mario and Link as Nintendo icons. The budget for sequels has gone higher and higher. They can afford another idol, there's three of them now. Oh, that's why it's called Splatoon 3, because 1, 2, 3. I mean, speaking of budget, in the original they spawned like this. They're like, hi. But now they're all like this. Oh, hey. You know what I'm saying? Let's wrap this up. I still really like Splatoon 1. Do I like it more than 2 and 3? In some ways, yeah, absolutely. Splatoon 2 didn't have Squid Jump. It's a bad game. So to summarize, ignore everything I've said in the last 20 or so minutes and go back for the loading screen minigame. God bless Squid Jump. I had a great time revisiting Splatoon 1. The Wii U may have had many hurdles, but this game was not one of them. This defined the system for years to come, and two sequels later, no game is quite the same as the very first Splatoon. So give it a go if you want to, there's still plenty of people playing, and I want to tell you, you in particular, yeah that one, you're not safe. I'm gonna find you in Splatoon 3. I don't care if we're on the same team, I'm gonna splat you. I'm gonna push you off the side. No one's safe from my reign of terror. Thank you for watching. Whoa, 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 whoa! You watched the entire thing! Thank you so much for watching these last 19 minutes or so, I really appreciate it. And if you're curious about that Meverse tease, I am preparing a much bigger video for next week, or maybe the week after. And we do have a preview of what it is on our Patreon, so if you want to support us, you can go and check that out right now.